Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Luke Humphrey with Luke Humphrey Running Podcast. And today we are going to continue on with our first marathon series. This is the fifth part. We're going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> understanding the fatigue of marathon training. From my experience as a coach and an athlete, these are the fatigue you feel with marathon training is significantly different than, say, training for a 5K. So I really think it's important that now, as we've talked about, getting you started, picking a plan, and then now you've been in the training and you're probably into the training quite a little quite a bit, we can actually talk about how that's actually supposed to feel a little bit. So let's uh, let's jump right into it. Uh, so when you run a race like a 5K or even just doing speed work, you know, air quotes there, the discomfort is very acute. You know, you have the, the, the lungs are burning, the level of discomfort is, is really visceral. It's not pleasant and you are, you're aware of that, you know, lactic burn in your chest as it's commonly referred to. Um, and when training for these types of races, we have to space very carefully our workouts so that we don't overdo it or we don't become overtrained. So there's, there's a lot of things we have to really be careful with balancing uh, really fast stuff in, in the amount of recovery we give ourselves. And that's true for the marathon too, but it's less important because the intensity overall is significantly less. Um, some people some people try well, to say you will develop you know, acidosis or, you know, increased um, acidity in the uh, in the body because of all the you know lactic acid which that's another discussion but it's fair enough to say that we have to do this that this is true for the 5k and 10k training maybe even up to the half marathon depending on your ability level but uh, but what about the what about marathon training do these rules apply does the body react the same way and if you know me the short answer is it depends, right? It depends on a lot of different factors. So when I see a lot of newer runners start running and even new marathon runners that have run, you know, shorter races, 5Ks and 10Ks, those types of things, as they start to get into heavier training, there's like a whoa kind of point, you know, is this is this supposed to feel like this? Am I, am I coming down with an illness? Am I, am I getting, am I on the verge of being hurt? Uh, you know, why am I so tired? Am I supposed to be this tired? Am I, is, should I get blood work done? You know, there's all these questions. Like, it's just, it's something that's very new. And learning to differentiate the discomfort from training fatigue and becoming sick or hurt during the marathon training is a skill that's literally going to make or break you, right? If you, the people I know who are the most successful are very good at this. They know whether it's just being tired from marathon training or they're on the verge of actually being injured, sick, or hurt. So you see, I have found that marathon training consists of a lot of vagueness in some exceptions to the rules. And, you know, it's, it's easy until it's not easy anymore. If you're fresh during the last six, eight weeks, then you probably aren't training hard enough. If you don't feel like taking a nap as soon as you get up in the morning, you probably aren't training hard enough. On the other hand, if you broke your foot from running too much, then you obviously took it too far, right? So it's easy till it's not. Learning how to, learning to know how it feels to be in that kind of gray zone is where the magic of the mar- marathon fitness happens. And my marathon mentors, Kevin and Keith Hansen, called it cumulative fatigue. So where you couldn't pinpoint your tiredness or fatigue to one single workout, rather the culmination of workouts over the course of several weeks. And to me, there are two key components to developing cumulative fatigue, and this is where we want to be. This is where we want to be towards the end of our, our training, just before we start to taper or, or to peak. So the developing cumulative fatigue versus being overcooked. The first is timing where you are feeling the fatigue. If you are early into your marathon training, or if you have more than eight weeks to go, and you're feeling burnout, then you're probably pushing too hard. And there's some things we need to look at. So usually when I see this, it means that the person has done their workouts in easy days, way too hard too often so not just running a workout and then you know correcting it later on but just chronically doing workouts too fast easy days and mostly easy days too fast because the workouts themselves tend to get tougher to to crank too hard but easy days are are tend to be where people really kind of push it too hard and don't allow themselves to truly take it easy they get really stuck on what the watch is saying and and that can end up being too too much for them 
uh, a lot of times they have the attitude that if fast is good, then faster is really good. And like I said, marathon training is easy until it isn't. So they might do this for four, six, eight weeks, and then all of a sudden, boom, it hits them. And they're, and they're just like, what the heck just happened? You know, so it's easy till it's not easy anymore. Things like general recovery, hydration, nutrition, sleep, things I harp on all the time, these could be factors as why all of a sudden they've kind of, you know, been exposed per se to um, kind of hitting that training block and hitting that training wall where it's just like, whoa, what mode am I doing? But um, things we, you got to recognize that things we might have been able to get away with when we were training for at lower levels, you know, things you got away with training at 15 to 20 miles a week aren't going to really necessarily be what you can get away with at 40 miles a week or 50 miles a week or, you know, all the way up to, you know, 120, 130 miles a week if you're, you know, at the elite level. Those, the things we do at those lower levels can definitely be hid over what we're generally doing. But everything, everything is, is, I guess the way you look at it is the faster you get and the more mileage you're running, the more the details become important, right? Because we can get, we can get a person to run on a four hour marathon if we can basically just get them to be consistently running, you know, 18 weeks, put in 40 miles a week. We don't have to do any special magic workouts to do, to get them to do that, right? If we can just get them to be consistent and running some decent mileage, we can get most people to be able to do that. But as more and more as goals increase, then it comes down to all the other little things where you're going to see those little percentages of performance increase. Because we've already maxed out what we can get at that 30, 40, 50 miles a week. So now we're, if we're not going to increase our mileage, where are we going to get those other increases in performance? And those things, that's what, hap- that's what I mean. Like when things get exposed that you weren't doing necessarily well at lower mileage that you can't get away with at, at the marathon level or just in general, higher amounts of training or as fast as you get. And really in any level, if you ran your first 5K and then you're increasingly getting faster and faster in a 5K, ultimately those details are going to become more and more important, especially as the amount of mileage that you do isn't going to really change. So where are those imp- improvements going to actually come from? So that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying that. And we can talk about we can talk about what to do in this case, but I have previous podcasts that cover it. Um, I'll link it in the show notes. I'll link it in, link it in the blog post. Um, we've, we've talked about that before, so we don't need to necessarily go into that, that again. The second thing when I, I look for when discerning from cumulative fatigue and overtraining is performance. And this is a big one because I've looked at lists of talk about, you know, the spectrum of, you know, fatigue from a workout all the way up to actual overtraining syndrome, which most people don't actually get to because they, they don't, they can't sustain that long enough in the in the um, functional overtraining, and then they get into the uh, non-functional overtraining, and that's where most people get when they're starting to get hurt and things like that. Overtraining, the actual overtraining syndrome is quite severe, and I don't think most people actually get to that point. Um, but there's a long list of like metabolic things, physiological things, sickness things, blood work, you know, all these different items that you would look at. But when you look at it, it could mean this, it could mean that. Um, So it's really hard to tell. And most people aren't necessarily just going to go get their blood work done because they're feeling like crap in training, right? They're not going to do that unless they actually get to the point where they have to see a doctor and a doctor makes them. Um, So the big thing for me is performance, right? Like if you're if you're not tra- if you're training hard and you're really sluggish when you wake up but your workouts aren't suffering you're still hitting your workouts then you're probably in cumulative fatigue but if you get to the point where you have a bad workout maybe you give yourself an extra day of recovery the next workout is maybe a little bit better but still not where it should be and then you, it just kind of slowly creeps down 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 and performance just keeps dropping off little by little over the course of several workouts you know, this could be not just one or two over the course of a month, but if it's like a steady trend that workouts are getting worse, then you're probably getting into that that third kind of phase where it's non-functional overtraining, which is what most people consider over overtraining, and that's where you can really start getting hurt, getting sick, things like that. And so that's when we really have to concentrate on pulling the reins back and hopefully getting catching it quick enough where we can pull you back and still salvage salvage your race. So. Um, 
but that's the big thing performance that's always what you really should look at it with training is is my performance suffering because if you're if your easy runs okay so let me differentiate that for a little bit so if your workouts so say your te your tempo runs yeah you feel like crap and you get through your warm-up but by mile three or mile four you found your rhythm and you're still overall hitting your pace that's probably cumulative fatigue but if it's gets worse and worse and all of a sudden the, the pay, you get into that workout you get four or five miles into that 10 mile tempo and it just keeps dropping off that's not a good situation to be in um so that's the big difference that's always going to be the difference maker is performance is going to suffer then then uh and that's a trend because then you can look at other things too and i think it's beyond what we're talking about today but that's when you really have to look at the big picture of what your training is looking like because I get so many times in our Facebook group where it's like they instantly go straight to the training, but they leave out all of these other factors that it could be. And I, I think it's more like they just don't even think about it because you don't, because there's so much to actually think about when you really look at like if they've done one thing and it worked, but then they try another thing and all of a sudden it's not working. What other factors do we have there? Do you know? And that's when we automatically look at nutrition, recovery, rehydration, um, paces that they're doing their stuff at, all those things play a role. Even today, I had a I had an email, uh, a thing in our run club where somebody's asking about a que a question about the plan. They're super tired. They've done this is their third time essentially doing the plan. So I know it's not necessarily the plan because the first two times they were successful. So then we had to dive in deep. Okay, so what led you up to this point? And come to realize, like person basically taken two months off of running, and then I think a couple weeks of running and then jump right into a plan. Well, they're at a point now where all of that is just catching up to them, right? So all that time that they had off where they lost fitness, probably jumping into a schedule that was a little bit too much for them to handle at that time because they didn't, they, they saw themselves where they had been and not where they, they are currently. And it probably all kind of gradually caught up to them. And that's what, that's the difference in marathon training too, is like, it's easy till it isn't, right? So the first few weeks were probably pretty easy. They managed it pretty well. As soon as the schedule got tougher, it happened right at a time where all the things in the back, back end of that, the last eight, ten weeks, all finally caught up to them. And so that was probably what their problem is. It wasn't necessarily the schedule. It was all the, all the weeks leading up to that point. So um, those are all things you have to be. And again, I say marathon training is easy until it isn't, you know, and then it's, and then it's not hard. And then it's not easy at all. All right. So I'll get off of that point now. So the question becomes how do we actually differentiate soreness versus possible injury? When to worry and when to just note as part of training. Um, and there's a quick list I have, I actually had a blog post on this, but uh, I'll list it quickly here. Um, soreness, both sides of the body, center part of the muscle, appears after a change of intensity or volume. Um, so if all of a sudden you've been doing easy runs and all of a sudden you do your first 12 by 400 workout, you're probably gonna be sore the next day, right? You're probably gonna be sore the next few days because it's just a change in what you've been doing. Improves after a warm up. It does not affect your form. It's generalized. You can, it's tough to pinpoint. Now, warning signs of an injury, basically the opposite. One side of a one side of the body towards the joint. Maybe it's at the you know, maybe it's in the knee, maybe it's in the hip, maybe it's in the ankle. Um, appears daily, worsens during a workout. That's one thing we talked about. Worsens or remains during the day. So if you do your workout in the morning and it lingers after the workout for several hours, probably the warning sign of an injury. It affects your form, causes a limp, causes a compensation, those types of things. Um, and then very localized. Like this is the first one of the first things I ask somebody. Can you, if you stuck your thumb into where it hurts, would it hurt? And if they say yes, that's probably an injury if it's just kind of sore it's probably not necessarily an injury at least at this at this point um and that's like the biggest like if you want to save money and not do a bone scan or get x-rays for a stress fracture if you can't jump up and down on that leg or if you can put your thumb right into a, a pinpoint spot i'm going to guarantee you that it's probably broken right it's probably a stress fracture so a little tip for you. you can save a lot of money you know and honestly like People want x-rays and they want bone scans, but an x-ray is not going to show it until it's already healing. And you know, obviously an MRI is going to be a much more expensive route to go. So if you think you have a stress fracture, if you can put your thumb right into the spot where it hurts and you're about, you know, or, or you have somebody do it and you're going to about punch them in the face, 
when they when they push on that spot, you, it's it's probably broken. So take that with you. But anyway, knowing the difference is is key to management. The only thing that I would add is if it, you feel like you have to take ibuprofen to get through a run, then you're probably already hurt. And there's other things too, like um, you know I I like the guy Dr. Uh, Bruce Wilk or PT Bruce Wilk. You know basically has a four point scale. If you're like a two or a three, you're probably not. You know it's probably getting worse. You've got a whole list of things, but basically what I just read off here, but there's a lot of different things you can look at, but those are the easiest things to kind of monitor without taking a lot of effort into it. Um, the last point there is, you know, without, you know, on the ibuprofen, all you're basically doing is masking the pain, right? And if you mask the pain, it's very easy to take it to the next level. So something that if you would have just taken a couple days off or modified your schedule a little bit, but you decide to take ibuprofen for it and go through the workout, go through a couple workouts, go through a long run, by masking the pain, you can, you're ultimately going to, because pain is telling you something's getting injured, right? And so if you're masking that pain, what you're doing is injuring it, but you're basically blocking your body to be able to, to feel it. So ultimately what you're doing is just creating more and more damage and it's not going to be, it's not going to be healing. So what, your ultimate goal, your ultimate thing there is either going to be take more ibuprofen or you actually just rip or break something, right? And so neither one of those options is, is a good option. So why not just modify or take a couple days off now? It's way better than having to take weeks off and potentially missing your race, let alone, you know, just the psychology factor of it just being, you know, eventually being even more depressed than you are now. Because in the back of your mind, you probably know something is wrong, but if you can mask it and you can get through it, then you know you make yourself feel better that you're still able to push on so you have that factor and then if you really get hurt then you're going to be you're really going to be be depressed because you know if you're training with a group you're seeing your group you know be successful um you're missing out on the race you're missing out on all the fun stuff before and after all that all that kind of stuff so it really is just going to make it worse if you if you miss two weeks and then then you have the financial thing and then you know the time and you know there's just a lot of things that would be worse if you t had to take two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks off because of an injury, then if you just take a few days off now or modify your schedule now and let your body heal and adapt and adjust and all those good things. So, you know, by at the end of the day, it's really just about keeping an even keel, right? So a bad day isn't going to be the end of the world and a good day doesn't mean you're ready to take on the world record. You know, a day off isn't going to make all that work you've put in disappear right all that that's not going away it's going to take a long time for that to go away um on the other hand a lot, a lot of pretty decent days are going to add up and it's going to pay dividends in the end it's like the old question on savings would you rather take a million dollar lump sum or take a penny and double it every day for a month you know my advice take the penny and double it every day because you won't notice how much difference you won't notice much difference in that first 25 days if you took the penny and just doubled it but the last five days blow your mind just just so you know it's like 5.3 million if you take a penny and double it every day for a month so think of it that way like the little bit you invest now is going to be huge dividends later on you just don't you can't overlook those little those little things that you could be doing now that's going to save you later on all right, so that's it for this week. Um, if you've liked the series, please consider taking a look at the, my book, Hanson's First Marathon. <clears throat> Obviously, you have the OG Hanson Marathon Method and Hanson's Half Marathon Method. Um, all three, I think people will benefit from. I think we put a lot of work into them and um, can help a lot of people. So as always, thanks for reading. Thanks for listening. And I will talk to you all later. All right, have a good week. Bye-bye.